welcome to this Palm Sunday celebration. Our kids, were that fun or what? All waving the announcement of Jesus' arrival. For those of you joining us online, I hope you caught a little bit of that. And we're aligning with our sister congregation over on the west side. And it's an announcement that when Jesus arrives, everything changes. For the last several weeks, we have been celebrating the magnificent encounters reflected in the gospel of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. We challenge you at the front of this to be reading from those gospel texts. I hope you have. I hope you've allowed the word of God to refresh your own spirit. I want to say just personally, this has been a very rich series for me. So grateful to Pastor Brian for the way that he has formed this. And and I'm grateful to be nurtured in it personally and, and preaching in it to share in this celebration. And we bring this series to its finale today. The series comes to a close, all in preparation for Easter next weekend. Hope you're preparing. Friday night, a service of contemplation will be available for us. Then the celebrative services on Saturday, two of them, four of them on Sunday morning, where we get to celebrate Jesus' presence. When Jesus arrives, everything changes. You know what's refreshed me so much in this encounter record in the Gospels is that these lives of these people, while they parallel our own, So we've been listening to these testimonies week after week of Jesus showing up in our lives at very dramatic seasons and moments. So many stories have taken my breath away, sometimes in grief, sometimes in joy. God is working. As we begin this morning, let's return to a segment from Kimberly's story. My name is Kimberly Mooney. My husband and I and our children have been attending ACC for about four years now. And after the recent sermons talking about encounters with God, and there was one talking about shame and guilt, the Holy Spirit really came over me and compelled me to share my story. Um, because for most of my life I've carried around a lot of shame and guilt because of things that have been done to me. And um, we had a son, our sweet 15-year-old son, Aiden, some of you know him as Miles, Um, and his dad left very quickly. He left when Aiden was five months old. He decided he didn't love me anymore. He didn't want to be part of my life anymore. And so I was carrying that box of shame and guilt from my childhood. And that box of shame and guilt only became more and more packed full. And when someone leaves you like that, you are left with such a sense of abandonment. You're left with such a sense of of filth and disgusting. I've gone through most of my life feeling like a disgusting person. Who, who wants to be around somebody that was beaten and abused as a child, who's been divorced and now has this little five-month-old baby? Who wants to be around that? And I can remember people telling me all the time, well-meaning people saying, God can use this, God can use this. And I can honestly tell you I got to a place where I hated hearing that phrase. I hated hearing that God can use this because I didn't see where God was using this at all. And so I had made a decision. I decided that I was going to raise my son. I was going to work as hard as I could to provide for us. And then I was ready for my life to be over. I decided that when Aiden turned 18, I was going to take my life. My job was done. My world revolved around that little boy, and I just wanted to raise him and get him off to college, and he wouldn't need me anymore. God had a different plan for me. I can remember laying awake at night after I would get Aiden to sleep, and I would cry my heart out out of loneliness and agony. For five years, I would cry my heart out because loneliness hurts so bad. And I found God in that loneliness. I found His strength. I found His power. And He kept me going day to day. 
I don't even, it's hard to even look back and remember those days because I know that God was literally carrying my feet to work every day. God was literally providing food for us every day. God was doing the heavy lifting for me. God was taking that big, huge, stuffed full box full of shame and guilt, and he was changing that box into a present. And I think that that is something so powerful for me and for other people struggling with hopelessness, with suicide, with addiction, with anything like that, that if you're willing to give that box of shame and guilt and struggle to God, He's going to hand it back to you and it's going to be the most beautiful box that you will ever see. And I think that is so empowering. Kimberly reminds us that earlier in this series, we talked about a box called shame. Let me help you fill out the sermon form that we've made available to you. Everyone has a box called shame. The interesting thing about it is that Jesus always seemed to meet people in their box of shame. Let me refresh your memory. No one in this room is exempt. Everyone has a box called shame. It's a box usually filled with three items. First off is our own embarrassments, things that we put in that box, things that we feel inadequate about. I'm a little bit overweight, I'm clumsy, not very athletic, my ears stick out some, I'm not as smart as my sibling. All that stuff seems to attempt to humiliate us, disqualify us. We make contributions to the box of shame. And second, there's stuff that other people put in that box. People have heard us, bullied us, disgraced us, abused us in some way. Such things have massive influence that can have dramatic effect, so much so as to confuse uh, the essence of our own value and to distort the foundations of our personal identity. The third thing in that box is what I would call unexplainables. They're just the strange things that happen that cause life to be hard. A child is born with brokenness or limitations. We lose a job, our career crashes, home burns in a fire, we have a fall, and now our life is very different in constant pain. I mean, weird issues that just show up to intensify the load of life that we carry. All kinds of things are in the shame box. At times, the weight of that box feels almost back-breaking. That's what's in the box. But let's also review what accompanies the shame box, because there are some loops that are common to the human practice. Let's follow, first of all, the white arrows. I call this God's loop, because hard things are going to happen to us. I want to be stable and upright and, and, and sat, but, but hard things happen to me, and I will need much humility to overcome the challenges from the shame box. I'll need to be humble enough to trust that God's word is indeed true when he says that all things work together for the good of those who love him and who are called according to his purpose. And there from that shame box, I enter the grief box where I experience very important things like, like godly sorrow. And I, I shed many tears trusting that God can hear my trembling voice. I wait on him to bring reconciliation and restoration and to heal according to his timing. I want to go back to a place where it's sure and stable, but only God himself can take me there. You see the loop of white arrows. But there's another discussion Destructive loop in the human experience. I'll call that Satan's loop. Follow the red arrows. The box of shame stirs in us this compulsion to act out. We act out in a quest to find some element of happiness, some release from the shame, in search of some pleasure point, something that would be satisfying, even if it's only for a moment. We act out. Sometimes we, we act out actually against ourselves in discouragement that also sometimes drives us to the basement of depression. Sometimes we act out against others and we become harsh and vicious in our words and our actions to those we should love. Sometimes we even act out against God 
Because you see, God, he, he probably should have prevented some of those things that are in my shame box. And because I don't think that he did, I want to want to act out against him. He's the one who's in charge of morality and design and life purpose and, and obedience. And so I act out against him. And I use my, my language, my mouth, my body, my actions as a strike back mechanism. Take that, God. We act out. When we act out, the, the guilt increases and it fills our shame box and it's a terrible cycle. I refresh your minds to that teaching to remind you of the loops that we humans encounter. But I'd also remind you that it was the shame boxes where Jesus really showed up. In all the encounters that we read about, in the Gospels, in the place of shame's past, Jesus could inaugurate a very different, a very redeemed future. Now, now here's something very striking. This final encounter in John chapter 8, Jesus shows up not only in the shame space, but at the actual point of acting out when it was being expressed. He shows up when people were caught in the act. I mean, that feels like such an incredible place for Jesus to make an appearance when I'm acting out in my rebellion, in my disobedience, when I am at the peak of my inebriation, when I am in, in the drug-induced high, when I am in the throes of sexual infidelity, when I am in the thick of a curse-laced tirade against my spouse, at the time when I'm acting out in deliberate disregard for the holy character of God. Jesus shows up there. In that awkward and humiliating moment, could Jesus even show up? It does appear that he does. And when I look at that chart on the screen, I am struck by the reality that there is no place on planet Earth that I could be out of the reach of Jesus' pursuit. There's no vent in my life. There's no burden too big. There's no issue to overcome that I am out of the reach of Jesus' pursuit. I don't doubt that for a moment we could have a wide collection of stories in this very room where where people would surprise us by telling how they encountered the divine reality in those worst, horrible experiences in life. God got your attention. So in, in this encounter, a very high drama, Jesus shows up at a moment when they were caught acting out in disgrace against him and his father, Jesus shows up. Let's watch. John chapter 8, beginning at verse 2. At dawn, he, Jesus, appeared again in the temple courts where all the people gathered around him and they, he sat down to teach them. Isn't that nice? Nice setting, all the people come to church, and Jesus is going to give a nice talk. Verse 3, there's an interruption. The teachers of the laws and, and the Pharisees brought in a woman caught in adultery. They made her stand before the group. Are you picturing this? And Jesus said, or they said to Jesus, rather, Teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. In the law, Moses commanded us to stone such a woman. Now what do you say? John gives us some commentary in verse 6. Uh, they were using this question as a trap in order to have a basis for accusing him. But Jesus bent down and he started to write on the ground with his finger. They, they kept on questioning him. So he straightened up and he said to them, let, anyone, let any one of you who is without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. And again, he, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. At this, those who heard began to go away one at a time. The older ones 
got it before the younger ones did, the older ones first, until only Jesus was left with the woman standing there. Jesus straightened up. He asked her, woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? No one, sir, she said. Then neither do I condemn you. Jesus declared, go now and leave your life of sin. Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute! The current play is now under review. <laughs> All right, show the reverse angle there. Yeah, expand that, blow that up. After the review, we have penalties on both sides of the ball. The woman caught in the act of adultery is guilty. She remains condemned. But she receives forgiveness. And she is instructed to go and sin no more. The review also reveals that there is a man who is attempting to escape responsibility. He is exposed. And he, along with all those who put him up to it, are guilty. And they are judged with no forgiveness. Reset the clock to zero, 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 for the time of judgment has come. You know that it was 48 years ago that the National Football League began experimenting with instant replay? It was in 1991 that the, the National Hockey League instituted instant replay as a mechanism of their officiating. It was in 2001 that after a disastrous playoff sequence, the NBA, National Basketball Association, brought in instant replay in 2002. <laughs> and 18 years ago, 2008, Major League, 16 years ago rather, Major League Baseball became the last of the four major American sports to institute and adopt instant replay. Why? Well, because human judgment is flawed. It's flawed by three things. By visual perspective, certainly another vantage point would give you an opportunity to see more than just one set of eyes could see. It's also flawed by personal preference. I've never met a fan in the stands of a stadium anywhere in the United States where there were not people steeped in personal bias for their team. It's also flawed by pride and stubbornness where... You know, I'm not really interested in the facts. I really only want to believe what I want to believe. Human judgment is flawed. And so into the scene at the magnificent temple of Jerusalem where Jesus is just having a peaceful teaching, a conversation with some dear folks who just wanted to come to church and listen to a nice sermon, there is an interruption of great consequence. A woman in the rough hands of a collection of men. She is brought in, drug into the space where Jesus is preaching and judgment is demanded. Now I want to take a closer look. Verse 3. The scribes and Pharisees brought to him a woman taken in adultery. Stop right there. 
The teachers of the law, the scribes and Pharisees, were constantly looking for a way to discredit Jesus. They were always trying to trap him in his words. Only this time, they had developed a very intriguing theological trap. They caught a woman in the act of adultery. In fact, I wouldn't be surprised if they actually got the man to do this to her just to create the trap. He may have been much a part of the trap. They shove her in front of Jesus right in the middle of the temple with all the people around. She's the centerpiece. You got to see her there. Master, this woman was taken in adultery in the very act. They keep saying that. They said this so self-righteous, so pompous, so indignant. They act all furious about this sin against God. Well, actually, adultery is quite serious. It's certainly serious for the one you have violated, and serious in the eyes of God. Leviticus chapter 20, verse 10 says, the man who commits adultery with another man's wife, even he who commits adultery with his neighbor's wife, the adulterer and the adulteress shall be put to death. The instant replay reveals that the men who brought this woman and accused her of breaking the law, they weren't keeping the law because they did not produce the other actor in adultery, only the woman. How convenient. They had a double standard. They didn't mind abusing the woman. You want to know something? Those accusers were adulterers too. Jesus teaches in Matthew chapter 5, you are adulterers because every time you look on a woman to lust after her in your own heart, you have committed adultery. He says further in chapter 5 in Matthew, and every time you divorce your wife for other than proper grounds and remarry another, you cause her... Wow, well, that, that's, that's directed specifically toward the scribes and Pharisees because that's exactly what they did when they wanted to put their wives away. They put her out, and when they did so, they caused her socially to be a disgrace where she would be untouched by anyone else, leaving her with the only ability to satisfy the needs of life by giving herself away shamefully. You cause her to commit adultery, and you commit adultery too. Your adultery is prolific. Oh, they're coming so sanctimonious. If they were really attempting to implement the law of Moses, they would have been required to execute each other. No. No, no, this, this is only a trap. That's all it is. But it was a very well-prepared trap. You see, if Jesus decides not to stone her, the leaders will say he is not of God because he defies the law that God gave to Moses. That's a problem. On the other hand, if he says to stone her, go ahead, then he's going to lose his reputation as the friend of sinners. And if he would stone her, then he would be required to stone all those others, reprobate sinners and, and, and uh, adulterers who he has had fellowship with. He's been eating and drinking with sinners all along. Oh, this trap, it's a very good one. It's the most profound moral issue in the entire universe. They had Jesus in a question of the ultimate dilemma of all its theological thoughts. Here it is. How does God harmonize his justice with his mercy? If God is righteous, if he's a God of justice, if he's a God of judgment, then by his holy nature, she must die. That's the legal code. If God is a God of love, of grace, of kindness and mercy and forgiveness, she must live. But how in the world can you harmonize such opposing things? How can God be a God of justice and forgive sin? How can he be a God of love and still punish? Watch how Jesus responds 
In verse 6, he just stooped down and with his fingers he started to write in the ground. The rocks were poised for launch, ready to be cocked and fired. What are you going to do with the woman? We caught her in the very act. Jesus unruffled. He just moves his fingers through the sand. They persisted, verse 7. They kept asking him. Finally, he lifted up and he said, Any one of you who has no sin, you be the first to cast the stone. And then he stooped down to draw in the sand again. He sort of just kind of let them fry in the burden of human hypocrisy. See, they knew each other. They knew what each other was like. And then from Jesus' words in verse 9, you can see their own conviction beginning to press against them. They, they were diving into their own conscience. And they, the text says they walked away. They walked away from this feeling of conviction. They walked away from Jesus. Now let me ask you, if you were feeling self-conviction in your own conscience in the presence of Jesus Christ, what would you do? Would you go to Jesus seeking forgiveness? I would. What did they do? They went away. The very opposite thing. See, that was the problem with the Pharisees. They never wanted to face the reality of their own sin. As soon as they, they even felt conviction, instead of falling down at the feet of Jesus, oh, forgive me, they went off in their own direction. See, that happens for many people. Even when we, we feel the conviction of our own sin, they don't run toward Jesus, the Redeemer, the Rescuer. They run away, containing, holding, still clutching their sin. And the only one left standing in the middle of church that day was a disheveled woman, embarrassed and shamed. She stayed in front of Jesus. She felt conviction of her own sin. She stood there to own it. What else could she do? She had been caught in the act. You know, there comes a day when you need to own your own stuff. You need to own your own stuff. Jesus said to the woman, where are your accusers? There's no one here to condemn you. And she answered, no one, Lord. And Jesus said to her, neither do I condemn you. Go and leave this life of sin. The question of the moment doesn't seem to be how do you harmonize the judgment of God with the grace of God? The first question actually surfaces higher of importance than those. The first question appears to be what right do you have to become this woman's judge? That's God's business, not yours. Jesus notices if, if no one is left to prosecute this case, then the trial's over. And you say, wait, wait how, how could he do that? I mean, how can a holy God just say, uh, go on, okay, don't do it again. How can he do that? I mean, how can God let her off the hook? This is a very serious thing. Somebody has to die. You understand that, right? And that's the point. That's just it. When he said to the woman, I don't condemn you. Go and sin no more. You know what he knew in his own divine heart? He knew full well that he would die for her adultery. He knew that. On the cross, it was the only way the only reason he could give her forgiveness because he would bear on his own body her sin. It becomes very personal. 
And every time he healed and forgave somebody, he experienced the anticipation of the cross. That woman's sin would not go unpunished. It would be placed on Christ. And he would die for her adultery. No wonder they call him friend of sinners. He's willing to die for your adultery. He's willing to die for your lies. He's willing to die for your curses against his holy name. He's willing to die for the foul thoughts and deeds that have come out of your mouth. He is willing to die for every sin you've ever committed and will commit. And he says to you what he said to the woman. I don't condemn When all the other sinners walked away and did not deal with Jesus, she stayed. Desiring that Jesus deal with her sin, she stayed to seek forgiveness. Your sin is covered. Your sin is covered. Let this be a gift of the incentive that you would leave and turn away from the sin that is poisoning your life. This is a gift. That's what he said to her. That's what he says to us. See, the price of sin is real. Somebody has to die. Either you will die in your own sin, or Jesus will die in your place as a loving gift. Why would anyone walk away from the friend of sinners? Heavenly Father, you, Lord Jesus, are alone, are our rescue. And the people in this room are caught in guilt. We stand before you today, no longer running away, but owning up to our sin and the repentance, seeking you to save us.